So, I've skipped through context and talked a bit about recommend, uh, sorry, implications of the context. I'd now like to just give you some thoughts on some recommendations and some ideas about where I think you should be thinking for uh, adapting to the future. And the first thing is, for most organisations that I've worked for, it's all about culture. At the end of the day, when you, when you think about transactional focused cultures where it's all ad hoc, it's reactive, it's all about revenue attainment and quota and commissions and it's all just monthly, quarterly, go, go, go. Um, that's not very customer centric. In fact, it's the opposite of customer centric in my view. Um, if you're talking about you know, a systemised approach versus a point solutions approach, where we all need to try and be is up here in this, this left hand corner, which is customer success obsessed. Buyers are demanding a great experience. They're going with the vendor who first adds value. They're demanding a, 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 you know, a pre-sale and post-sale experience. It's not just get to sale and then move on, see you later Mr. Customer, on to the next one. So we need to change our cultures first and foremost before we can really affect any other change. Easier said than done, of course. Um, some, I think Philip, you said before about transformation, it used to be called change management. You're quite right. Um, in the old days, it was, you know, create a sense of urgency, um, get senior management buy-in and try and affect change all the way down the organisation. Cultural realignment is not easy, but it has to be a move towards lifetime customer value, um, you know, teaching and not selling. I'll talk a bit more about that uh, shortly. And really creating an amazing experience where you get customers to become your advocates. The greatest unpaid sales force in the world is your own customers. When they're really happy, they will sell your product for you. So that's number one, culture. Um, number two, sales enablement. Quick show of hands, who's got in your businesses a sales enablement head or a separate sales enablement function? Quite a few, good. <coughs> good to hear. 51% um, apparently of US based organisations are now establishing a separate sales enablement function. Stand alone. And what that means is that the sales enablement piece sits across all of the other verticals in the business. Again, to the point about creating that, that culture that enables sales, enables the buyer. I think that's, that's clearly where the world is headed. It's not just about having a sales team and a marketing team and lines of business. It's about having a coordinated approach <coughs> through sales enablement. And lots of businesses are now heading down that path. Back to this one. Turnover reduction. Again, to my point earlier about how ridiculous this is. The average cost every time this happens, um, there was a report or a study done out of the US, I converted it to Australian dollars, $148,000 in retraining, rehiring and re-recruiting a new person each time this 16.8 months thing happens. Does that sound about right? It's a fairly big cost, isn't it? That's really only the tip of the iceberg because when you look at this next part, which is the real cost, Productivity, if this is the territory, and that's the expected quota of the, of the rep or the performance of the rep, when, when that rep has either disengaged or he's been put on a performance improvement plan, there's a dip, isn't there? They switch off. In comes the competitors. While they're disengaged, they're not selling. So there's this dip in productivity. Lost sales due to underserved customers, competitive displacement, all of these things that go on while that's happening, while you're managing that person out, trying to identify a new person, bringing that person in, and the cycle starts again. That looks like about 13 months to me. Three months of you know, disengagement, three months of rehiring, another seven months of onboarding, roughly. That can cost anything between $50,000 and a million dollars a rep. Think about that. If, that. if that rep's carrying a $1 million quota, and for 13 months they're totally disengaged or that territory is disengaged, that's a massive, massive problem. So we've got to stop this turnover of salespeople. I've seen too many sales leaders in the past just take the easy way out and say, oh, you know, Sally's no good, Dave's no good, get them out. Three months in, you hired the person, train them, mentor them, bring them up to speed. Don't just put them in a pigeonhole and say they're no good, get them out. We're turning over too many people, and this, this is just crazy in my view. Um, everyone's heard of HubSpot, no doubt. Yep, 
I've got to tell a little story about my experience with HubSpot. Um, and it was a light, light bulb moment in my career. And it only happened 18 months ago. So in setting up my business sales tribe, I realized I needed some help with marketing automation. I knew very little about it. And I'd been hearing about this HubSpot thing for a while. And I saw a tweet. I thought, I'm going to have a look at this. I jumped on the website, downloaded a white paper, knowing full well that I'd get the call from the HubSpot guy. The next day, I got a call from this guy. Jack Doran, young Irish fella in the Sydney office in Australia, he called me and he introduced himself by saying, hi, I'm Jack, I'm an inbound marketing specialist. And I thought, yeah, okay, sales guy. I, put, I was a buyer, but I put my sales cap on every time I engaged with someone and I was critiquing this guy's call. We got about 10 minutes into this call and I thought, this guy's hopeless. <laughs> he hasn't asked a single spin question, a bant question. He hasn't tried to qualify the size of the deal, compelling event. There was no qualifying. He was just educating me. He said to me, what do you know about marketing automation? I said, very little, Jack. Tell me. So he, he just started to you know, inquire as to my understanding and, and fill the gaps. The call went for 45 minutes. And at no stage this, did this guy do anything that remotely looked like push selling. He was just teaching and educating. The call ended by him saying, all right, Graham, look, it's been really nice to talk to you. Anytime you're ready to talk again, just give me a call. I said, what? I was waiting for what are the next steps? You know, what's the call to action? When can we meet again? There was none of that. It was really, well, it was refreshing in the end, but I just, I felt strange. <laughs> I felt really, as a sales guy, I just felt like this was weird. Anyway, um, I pondered that for a few days and I thought, this is, this is the new, the kind of the new way. I mean, this kid's only 32, so originally, as I said, I thought he was just a hopeless sales guy. But turns out he's, he's an inbound marketing specialist, as he said. <laughs> so I, I went out and bought um, the book, The Sales Acceleration Formula, written by Mark Rabage. And Mark Rabage is the guy that built the sales, the, sorry, the HubSpot um, sales methodology. And when you look at the, the ethos that is at the heart of everything they do at HubSpot, it's what Brian Halligan said, the CEO, the founder. He said, create value before you try to extract value. And that is exactly what these guys do. So this diagram here, this HubSpot buying journey, was actually from the book. As soon as I saw it, I'm like, ah, oh, that's what this guy's done. So we had this conversation, actually the, the touch points are here. These are the exact touch points that he took me through. I, ha I saw a tweet, I downloaded a white paper, I got a phone call. We did an online demo and some more content was sent. Um, Mark Rabage uh, explains in the book that throughout the buying journey, they've, they've outlined and mapped the buying journey, they've got various different types of content that they use to help progress the buyer through the buying journey. And when you think about it, that is, that is the complete opposite of what I've always done. It was always a sales process. These guys are using content primarily, as you know, they all do a lot of content creation to help, help a buyer take themselves through the buying journey, if you like. So if you get a chance, have a read of that book. That's a terrific book. So one of the things that I now do with my clients is this very, very simple exercise along the lines of what HubSpot do. It's buyer journey mapping. And again, to make the point, rarely do... Uh, do buyers go through a, a completely linear and simplistic view of the buying journey like that one is. But they do go through a journey of some sort, so you can map that out. The next thing we try and look at when I'm doing this exercise with my clients is what are the trigger events? In other words, what are the things we're listening for, typically on social? What are we listening for from the buyer that might suggest they've moved from a status quo position to a window of discontent? What are the impediments that might take them from one stage to the next? So there's all of these trigger events that we could start to listen for. Once you've, map, um, you've mapped out the, the trigger events, then you can start to look at what are the messages that we want to convey to the buyer at each of these stages along the journey to help, to help them come through the journey in the same way that HubSpot do. Then you can start talking about tools, and I think Martin mentioned the fact that there's so many tools out there now. It's hard to keep track with all the tools, sales tech, martech. MarTech, a $10 billion industry that didn't, sorry, $30 billion industry that didn't exist 10 years ago. That's the explosive growth that we're seeing in that space. Once you've done all of that, it's very simple 
even as a sales leader and sales team, to then map out what are the typical touch points that you can take through with each customer. So this is a really simplistic, I know it's, you know, don't, it's not the be all and end all, but it's a really simplistic way of mapping on one page the typical steps that your buyers go through when they buy your products and the touch points that, that you use. Once you've done that, what happens is the sales guys go, ah, okay, so I'm not using spin model or BANT or any of those methodologies. I'm actually using the buying journey to guide what I should do next. And I think that's a clever way of doing it. It's working well for my clients. Give it a try. Number five, social selling matters. Um, I was hearing some interesting comments before about social. Everyone's got a slightly different view. I'm a huge fan of social, um, primarily because um, even though my business only launched in March this year, to this point, and it's early, I've not had to make a single outbound call or a single outbound email because I'm using educational content to drive inbound. Now, that might change in the, in the near future as we start to identify new, new target segments, but certainly the social aspect cannot be underestimated. It's hugely, hugely important. That's where the buying journey really starts. The buyers are online. Um, Justin Roth Marsh, who's heard of Justin Roth Marsh? Anybody? I think he's, um, he's living in Australia, but he's from somewhere else. He said, and I think it's great, he said, field sales was fine when the buyer resided out in the field, uh, but the buyer now resides online. So social selling matters. You'll, you'll notice I've crossed the selling because we, we don't sell on social. It's, it's anything but selling. We're using social to listen, to engage, and to build a network. We're not using it for selling as such. Social listening, buying stage appropriate messaging, social voice, personal branding, and um, you know, then start to have a think about this one, which is your network. Um, I, I'm flabbergasted that people would think that on LinkedIn, I only connect with people I've met. There's no harm, actually, in connecting with people you haven't met. They're not going to turn up to your barbecue or something. <laughs> right? They're not going to stalk you. Um, you know, and the, and the, the exponential growth of the network. So currently I'm sitting at about 16,500, 17,500 first level connections, which translates to about 5.7 million second level connections and it's 46 million third level connections. So when you understand the, the exponential power of social to give you that reach, they might be very you know, thinly veiled connections at, at, at the third level, but occasionally you can use that where you can say, listen, I know, Mark, I notice you know so-and-so, could you introduce me? Um, those are the sorts of tools you've got to start to use. Participation in an open network, I think, is critical. So, this is another one that's always attracts a little bit of discussion. Social selling index. Any, anybody, anybody measure that? Yeah, a few people. Mine, I spend a lot of time on LinkedIn, clearly. Um, I'm at 86 out of 100 currently. And I use a lot of insights and content to try and drive, you know, engagement. People in the industry, in my industry, the average social selling index in high tech sales profession, 20, 28 out of 100. So clearly, we have a long way to go in the sales profession, I think, uh, around leveraging these sorts of platforms, social and digital. Sales people of the future will be digitally driven, socially connected, highly mobile, and specialised. Again, yeah. Your network was everything. Yeah. It, it was close, right? You, it's who you knew. Correct. That was your value. Yeah. The, the Rolodex. Was yeah. So you're about ninety degrees. You think? Look, I think it's. I mean, you can you can overstate the case. I think there's. The network still is important, always was. As you say, your, your, your card file or your Rolodex was always, you know, who do you know? Yeah. And that, that's di what dictated whether you got the job <coughs> or not. Now, of course, with social, um, y you're putting all of that on steroids. It's, it, it's turbocharging everything. You know, you've got a global network now. We all compete in global businesses, right? No one's just... I'm not a territory rep in Melbourne anymore. I'm a territory rep in the world. So scale it up, is my opinion. Um, I like what Damesh Shah said, he's the other co-founder of HubSpot. By the way, I'm not endorsed by HubSpot. Um, I haven't been paid a cent by them, but certainly I've um, I found engaging with them to be 
uh, extremely insightful. So I do tend to uh, follow them. But he said, uh, we've gotten much better at blocking classical outbound, haven't we? Talking to voicemail. If you're cold calling, you're just leaving voicemail messages. Two out of a hundred. Chet Holmes wrote the book, um, The Sales Acceleration and something or other. Can't remember now. He said, only 3% of your target addressable market is ever in a buying window at any given point in time. And that translates to what we now see as the effectiveness of cold calling. People block cold calling. In fact, you guys, I was just saying to someone before, Alex, I was just saying, um, in the UK, you've got a, a law apparently now where directors of companies who engage in nuisance calls can be fined. So I think you might be leading the way. And GDPR and all this stuff is coming in. Um, blocking outreach from salespeople. I wrote a post um, not too long ago that created some controversy, deliberately. I said, in Australia, the message you send when you cold call somebody is that you have no other option and that you're probably calling from a low cost call centre somewhere else. Because why would you pay a six figure earning sales guy huge amounts of money to sit and make 100 calls and maybe get two if you're lucky? Downside being that you piss off the other 98%. You destroy your brand with the other 98. I, I just can't see why people would do that. Particularly when you can use content. You talked about publishing. You know, the, the big companies now are, are, are becoming publishing companies. Red Bull now is considered to be a media company that just happens to sell soft drink. They use content, lots of content, to, to drive inbound. There's no reason why all salespeople can't be curating content, not necessarily creating your own content, but certainly sharing the marketing people's content, sharing other people's content, using content to engage, to build your network. Um, so, and, and I think this guy, Guy Kawakaski, said it well. If you've got more money than brains, you should focus on outbound. If you've got more brains than money, focus on trying to create some inbound. <laughs> There's never been a better time to get information about the people that we're trying to target. There's information everywhere. We can find out all we need to know about our target customers. Paradoxically, it's never been harder to engage them. So, yeah, you're right. It's a combination approach. Do you use the phone? Do you use email? Do you use text? Do you use Facebook, Instagram, whatever? However it is that you engage. You're right, there's never, a, well, in my experience, there's no black and white when it comes to sales. There's always an exception um, and there, there is always a balance to your point, Martin. But certainly big brands are now spending more and more of their, their budget on content marketing, creating that engagement. I talk about this at, in some detail in the book and that's just a five step process for sales people if you're in sales role now and you need to specialise, then perhaps gratuitous plug, go and buy the book. <laughs> Only 10 quid. Um, the five step process on how to do that is, is outlined in the book. You know, you've got to pick, pick an area if you can. It's not always easy to pick where you're going to work, but pick an area of passion, an area that has some future growth, obviously, and an area that's going to be of some value to your buyers and specialise in that. Develop deep domain knowledge about whatever it is you do. If you don't, why would your buyer spend five minutes having a coffee with you? You're not adding any value. So you've got to specialise. There's the book. Um, given that context or that exponential graph I showed earlier and the, the fact that Telstra are now worried this, they're creating this war chest, everyone's concerned about risk. All of the businesses we sell to are worried about making the wrong decision. They're worried about disruption. So I would urge everybody now to focus some of the dialogue early in the, in the sales process, early in the conversation around risk. I think um, certainly in Australia, too many, too many salespeople default to features, advantages, benefits, you know, ROI, all of that stuff that we, we get taught to do. They don't bring up risk because they're worried about what the buyer might say. Um, a client recently won a big deal in Melbourne with ANZ Bank. It was a $12 million deal. After the deal was done, we invited the CFO of ANZ Bank to come in and talk to the sales team. Uh, we said to the, the, the CFO, could you stand up and tell us you know, what it was like engaging with our sales team, the account management team, and you know, how, how come you, you chose us? Why did we win? CFO stood up and he said, um, got some bad news for you, Tom. It had nothing to do with you. 
Tom was the account manager. It had nothing to do with you. We chose you. Uh, the company was Experian, it's a UK company. We chose Experian because we see you as a safe pair of hands. And that's it. We need to know that you can fulfill your obligations on this contract, no matter who's in charge, CEO, top down, doesn't matter. So it's all about risk and being that, you know, I mean, that goes back to good old IBM. No one got fired for buying I IBM, right? It's the same thing. So yeah, do focus some of the pre-sale discussion on risk. Did Tom still get his commission? He did. Yeah, yeah, yes. <coughs> um, this one's been talked about already too. It's um, interesting, the crossover, but certainly Pace Productivity did a study uh, out of the US and found that when you look at the number one, people say the number one cause of sales underperformance is lack of pipeline. I say that's nonsense. Lack of pipeline is a result of not spending your time as a salesperson in the right areas. We're asking salespeople to do all this other stuff to Martin's point, 22% of the time they spend selling. And really that's, that's not very clever. Why pay someone a high paid resource, in most cases, to spend their time doing low value activities? You've got to get them up here to the high value activities, the activities that actually produce the results. Asking salespeople to spend, I'm not sure what your stat was now Martin, but I think you said it was 20% of their time on CRM or something like that. Spending a lot of time doing internal stuff. Be careful about how you master your minutes. And finally, this one's been touched on as well. I think, um, Alison, you talked about EQ and behavioural, and this goes to your point too, Philip. Um, everyone's talking about IQ and EQ. You've got to, be, you've got to have you know, the brains and the people skills. This gentleman, Dr. Mark, Michael Edwards, created this little diagram. It's more for leadership than it is for, for selling, but I think it's spot on. There's a third part, and that is execution <coughs> quotient. You know, IQ and EQ mean nothing if you can't go out and execute. I think we're all, some of us now are all um, paralysed with fear to do anything. Yes, everything's changing, but I think we've still got to get out and take action. Test and learn. IQ and EQ are, are great, but you've got to be one of those salespeople and marketing people that take some action. As Mis Mr. Gretzky said it well, you miss 100% of the shots you don't take. <laughs> so, you know, test and learn, test and learn. You'll fail, we'll all fail, but you just keep doing it. So, yeah, take action would be my, uh, my final recommendation. So, the future of sales in summary. The context changing fast. We all know that. I don't think anyone disagrees in this room that we have to adapt and we have to adapt quickly. Sometimes, to go back to that discussion, I think it was the panel discussion, sometimes the poor old sales guy is being driven by an outdated sales leader who's been told by the CFO, here's your quota, Mr. Sales Leader. Make sure you don't stuff it up. Spread it out across your sales guys and just keep cranking that same old handle as hard as you can for an incremental gain on last year's numbers. And that's kind of what's been happening. Certainly in Australia, that's what happens. And I see salespeople behaving the way they were in 1997. So I think we have to adapt and, and transform quickly or else face the consequences. The problem here is, let's be clear, the hub spots of the world are raising the bar on customer experience. I was never going anywhere else. After that call and the follow up that that guy Jack did at HubSpot, I didn't bother going to Salesforce or Aliqua or Marketo or any of those other companies. I was so impressed with what he did in terms of adding value as a buyer, I was going to always go with HubSpot. I've got to, actually, I've got to tell you quickly. Are we okay for time? Yeah. A few more minutes. A few more minutes. Okay. That means we're out of time. <laughs> um, very quickly, the, the, the synopsis of that story is that... Hang on. That's a, a bit of a message. <laughs> Auto off. It is a message. There you go. Um, yeah, that's a wind up. Um, the the finalisation of the HubSpot story was that we'd gone through six months post that phone call of um, demos uh, and more content and me getting familiar with what it is that they do. And I said to Jack, OK, I'm ready to go. Let's go. I want HubSpot. He said, eh, you're not ready. <laughs> <laughs> Literally, it's what he said. I said, what do you mean I'm not ready? He said, look, I'll level with you, Graham. He said, it's a career limiting move for me if I bring you onto our platform, SaaS-based platform monthly. 
If I bring you onto our platform and you churn inside three months, that's really bad for me. And there's a few things with your website you've got to fix up and blah, blah, blah. There were some reasons. But he stopped me from moving forward with that sale because he was worried that the HubSpot model, they need to get you through to 18 months in order for them to make you know, decent profit out of that. So they can't afford to have me come on if I'm not ready. So a totally different mindset. I've never turned back a purchase order, ever. So, whoops, what have I done there? There we go. Transform to be customer success obsessed. We've just been talking about that. Stop this turnover reduction if you can. That's killing businesses. It's killing the relationship with buyers. Buyers hate it. In the, as I say, in the research phase of the book, every buyer I interviewed said, I'm sick and tired of having this revolving door of salespeople. Um, map the buying journey wherever you can. Get attention. You know, go back to the buying journey where, you know, first 57% of it is, is done without talking to a vendor. How do you get in early? How do you get their attention back here in the journey before they start so you're the one that they come to? Using content is probably the, the first, first port of call. Salespeople have got to specialise. Um, Martin said it. Again, I know I've referred to Martin a lot, but I agree with everything you said. Uh, embrace the bots because they are coming. They are here to stay. Artificial intelligence. And, um, you know, you have to be very good at social media. That's what the future looks like, in my humble opinion. Um, and to finish off with this particular favourite quote of mine, I think that says it all, doesn't it? <laughs>